Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here in this panel, Lessons from ITP Virtual Reality. My name is uh, Pablo Figueroa, and I, I'm here with Doug Bowman, Evan Suma, and Anthony Steed. Uh, I hope you learn a lot in the, last, in the next hour. So what is IT pre -VR? Um It's really a community. It's a community of researchers and academics working on virtual reality and related topics. And um, we have been, for a while, doing this. Uh, this is from a, a T-shirt that we got in 2013. Uh, you can see here some of the conferences, and previous to 1999, there was another name, so it's actually more than 50 years of this conference and this community. Uh, it also gave birth to several other conferences. Uh, some of you may know some of those names, uh, but it's just to give you an idea of, of uh, where we come from. Uh, what we want to do, we want to create um, a new community, something in which uh, we as academics and you as uh, developers uh, can talk and dialogue about uh, virtual reality and related topics. Uh, we would like to uh, uh, share with you some interesting ideas that we have developed in the last years about uh, research in VR. And we also would like to hear all those exciting uh, ideas that you have for new developments, for new applications. So we would love to create this new community between IEEE VR and GDC. Uh, so some examples of things that we have done in the past that maybe resemble things that you may know now. Um, there is a, this nice uh, but uh, really weird word, perambulator, uh, from 1996 that may resemble something that you know now. And uh, there is a really nice project that uh, Evan and some other people at uh, ICT did uh, some years ago in 2011 that also relates to some projects and products that you can find now successfully in the, in the industry. So um, what we want to have is uh, you uh, in this community, we call it the Myriad for Mixed Reality Research and Development Group, and we'll try to talk a little bit more later about it. So we are going to talk about these uh, topics as soon as we can, so we would like uh, to have time at the end for questions from you. Uh, please also don't forget to fill uh, some questionnaire that you will receive about the evaluation of this panel at the end. So without further ado, we'll start uh, with one of our guests, uh, Doc Bowman. All right, thanks, Pablo, uh, and thanks to all of you for coming. So uh, I'm a faculty member at Virginia Tech, and I run something called the 3D Interaction Group, um, also the Center for Human-Computer Interaction there. And so one of the topics that IEEE VR and the, the research community around VR has looked at quite a bit uh, over the years is 3D user interfaces, 3D interaction. Um, and so a lot of that work actually got gathered up into a book um, shown here, 3D User Interfaces Theory and Practice. And we're actually working on the second edition of this right now, so it's a bit out of date at the moment, but uh, second edition should come out soon. But a lot of the research has been organized around this kind of so-called universal 3D interaction tasks. So these are things that you find in many applications, games included. Uh, and those are selection, manipulation, navigation, and system control. And so I could talk about examples from all of these, but uh, what I want to do today is really just dive into the first one uh, a bit, selection, and try to use that as uh, an example of how we can do innovation in 3D interaction. So let's talk about that. So what is 3D selection? So it's very simple, right? You have a bunch of objects or targets in your scene. You want to pick one or more of them uh, uh, in, in order to perform some action on it or to shoot it or s something along those lines. The first things that you're going to think of if you're doing VR is, well, it's virtual reality, right? So we should do it the same way that we do it in the real world. Uh, and how do we select things in the real world? Well, we touch them or we point at them. Um, and so that leads to two uh, kind of so-called natural interaction techniques for 3D selection. So one would be the simple virtual hand. I track my hand. I put a virtual hand at that location. That virtual hand touches an object, and I can select it. Um, the problem with that, of course, is it only works within arm's reach. So if I want to select something that's farther away, I uh, might want to point at it. And so I could use a laser pointer metaphor or ray casting to do that. The problem is that when you get to kind of the hard cases of selection, these techniques really break down. 
Um, so when we have targets that are far away, simple virtual hand doesn't work, as, as I've already said. When you have targets that are small, um, both of them uh, can really uh, fall down in terms of performance. Targets in cluttered regions and moving targets are especially hard to select. And in addition, if we just kind of take, take this natural approach, uh, there are some things that often fail. Uh, so some of that is based on technology, and technology we hope will get better. But trackers have jitter, all right? They have pre precision issues. They have latency. Um, and that's going to cause both of these techniques to, uh, to fail in many cases. Um, but then there are some things that are harder to fix. So the human uh, user himself or herself also has natural hand jitter. And so overcoming that is, is, is much more difficult. And then the environments that we want to design may have very distant targets or occluded targets, and that's also hard to overcome. So all of this kind of uh, leads to a situation where these so-called natural techniques are really only semi-natural. They don't work as, as fluidly or as easily as you would expect them to, given your real-world experience. And even if we could get to fully natural techniques, those wouldn't be optimal either. Um, so it's VR, right? We can do things that are magic. Let's go beyond what we can do in the real world. So let me give an example of that. Uh, this is a technique that one of my students developed called double bubble. Uh, I didn't make up the name, or maybe I did. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, double bubble extends the ray casting idea, but it, it extends it in three kind of interesting ways, um, or uh, two, two ways. So the first is that uh, it uses a volume cursor instead of a point cursor. So you're casting a, a sphere or a cone out into the environment. And that cursor is dynamic, so it changes size depending on the targets that are in the region that you're pointing at. And then secondly, it uses this idea of progressive refinement, which means that um, we're going to do a, a bunch of kind of easy selection tasks in order to get to one precise selection result. So uh, rather than trying to explain that in the abstract, let me just show you how that works. So here's a, a very cluttered virtual environment. It's a supermarket that has thousands of objects. We want to be able to select them from far away. So the way Double Bubble works is you point with this sphere out into the environment. The sphere changes size depending on uh, the targets that are in that region. And then the targets that fall inside the sphere are placed into a, a menu layer uh, that, that uh, expands into a 2D menu. Uh, and objects are sized appropriately, and they're positioned appropriately so that the object that you're selecting in the menu is uh, somehow spatial, spatially related to the object that you want to select in the environment. So you do two actions for every selection, but both of those actions are, are super easy to perform. So this solves all the problems that we mentioned before. Um, it allows you to select distant targets, small targets, targets that are uh, very close to others, and even targets that are moving. Didn't show that in the video. And so we've done some evaluation uh, on this, and uh, here's some performance numbers. So we looked at selection time and number of errors that people made in selecting large, medium, and small targets. And you can see that with ray casting, performance degrades pretty quickly when you go to small targets. But with double bubble and techniques like it, you can get uh, both uh, faster performance and more error-free performance without much effect of the target size. So that's pretty cool. Now, of course, not everyone is interested in just performance. Um, that may not be the most important metric or even an important metric for games uh, or other kind of experiential applications. Um, so we also look at overall user experience, and we've asked uh, questionnaires, basically, of our participants. And participants almost uniformly preferred this, this technique over the raycasting technique. So uh, that's just an example, right, of how we can innovate in 3D interaction. And so I wanted to try to kind of uh, uh, abstract that process, if I could. So we start with one of these universal tasks in the, in the case of, uh, that, I, that I was just talking about, the task of selection. We think about a real-world metaphor, touching or pointing, um, and we come up with a concept for a natural interaction technique. But because of these limitations, both of the technology and the real world that we live in, we end up with a technique that's only semi-natural, and that results in usability problems. So the way to innovate, at least that I'm suggesting here, is that we break real-world assumptions. Um, we do things that are magical or, uh, or beyond what we can do in the real world. And so we get a magical interaction technique with improved usability. 
And so I'm not going to talk about it, but there are examples for all of those interaction tasks that I mentioned before, selection, manipulation, navigation, and system control. Examples of taking uh, kind of these semi-natural techniques, breaking real-world assumptions, uh, and then resulting in, in more usable magical techniques. And I'd be happy to share information on any of these that you're interested in later if you want to talk. So just to wrap up uh, and kind of summarize this with uh, a, a kind of a, an abstract plot here. And the plot is, is kind of like the Uncanny Valley diagram, if you're, if you're familiar with that. And what we're plotting here is interaction fidelity, that is how realistic the interaction technique is versus effectiveness. And most of the time, uh, developers kind of start on the right-hand side of the graph, right? And so we're trying to make things more and more natural. And that can help. That can improve effectiveness. But the problem is there's a very steep slope at the right-hand edge of the graph, and it's hard to get all the way to the fully natural technique. So what I'm suggesting is that instead we can go the other direction, actually intentionally make interaction techniques less realistic, less like the real world, to get these either hypernatural, that is extending the real world, or supernatural, that is uh, just magic. Uh, techniques that may have greater effectiveness. And this is a gross overgeneralization. Your mileage may vary, but I think this is a, an approach that, uh, that it's interesting to look at. Um, the other thing that Double Bubble shows us is this idea of precision interaction with imprecise tools. So this idea of pr progressive refinement allows you to do interactions that, are, that have a precise result, but that don't require any sort of precise input on the part of the user, and that can be really powerful. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Anthony. Uh, hello, I'm Anthony Steed from University College London. Um, and I want to start with a, an observation um, which has motivated me to study virtual reality for a very long time, um, since I started my PhD in 1992. Uh, it's this, quote, this idea of uh, virtual reality in, as the perceptual illusion of non-mediation. And we could, we could, we could discuss what, what exactly that means um, for hours, um, but it's, it's pervaded quite a lot of what we do. The idea that you are the agent acting and you're not primarily moderated by the devices that you need to learn. Um, the easiest uh, explanation of, uh, I use in lectures when the students is uh, you, you've never lost, you, you, occasionally you stare, you stare at your computer screen and you've lost the mouse, but you've never lost this. You, you, you've never, unless it's damaged or you've fallen asleep on it, you know where your hands are. So in the virtual reality, you, uh, which is your senses in your body, are immersed um, and you know what's going to happen and that you, your, your changes in your multisensory and stimuli are predictable because that is what your brain has learned from many prior to VR experiences. So um, we know that when we turn our heads, what's going to happen. We know when we move our, our limbs, what's going to happen. And there's a, as many other speakers have said, there's a whole complex of things that we expect in a, in a virtual reality system um, when, we, when we move. So I want to pull out two things that we've, we've worked on and many people in the field have worked on. One is quite deep, which is how your movements are reproduced is critical. And I mean that in sort of spatial resolution, but I'm going to uh, also timing, and I'm going to talk about timing myself. And also, the second one is a very broad implication, very broad sources of information, which is what you see is important for a sense of motor match. Um, so I, uh, people in the field will know me. I've gone on a lot about latency over the years, and um, it's, it's important not just because of uh, reducing sickness, but because latency is critical for performance. There's a long way to go, right? So we're we've got systems now with end-to-end -end latency of about 18 milliseconds commercially available. Um, in the lab, we have things that are under a millisecond, um, but you have to come to London to see them. Um, but under, what we know is that there's a, f the, 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 there's, there's, there's a way to go yet. Um, so if you're optimizing 3D interaction, you're going to really have to understand what it is your latency is, or you know, your results may not transfer from one system to another one, or even from one game to another one, because uh, you, you need to understand what you've been studying. Now, uh, there are hundreds of papers on this, this sort of topic, what the latencies in systems, and in particular, there's, there's a whole set of them. There's a sort of 2D task called Fitt's Law, um, and this is, this is, yeah, this is 
academic uh, um, have been obsessed with this because it's driven the devices, 2D devices like mice, key, um, locators, touch pads, and so on. Um, and lots of VR people have used this, um, but bear in mind that you know, we used to be dealing with systems with latency from about 30 through to 200 milliseconds. And uh, the, the news is that essentially it gets, it gets counterintuitive under about 30 milliseconds. Um, so I don't have time to go through what all these graphs mean, but essentially what we've recently found um, is that the, the human body has latency in it. So when you move, um, you know, the, the commitment to a motor action has some latency in it, which your brain sort of understands um, uh, what the latencies are. And actually, if you've got a system that's about 30 milliseconds latency, it's actually fastest on this, this task. And as the system gets more natural, um, then it actually, so the latency goes down, it's more like the real world. Actually, your performance goes down. Um, so you get slower at this task, which is counterintuitive, but um, also may mean it's bad news for any sort of VR game where you're competing against a very highly optimized 2D representation. Um, so your first-person shooter may be not, a, not a, uh, as efficient on a VR with it, as the low, get worse in some senses as it gets more latent, but it's more natural as it gets lower latency. So that's driven a lot of hardware research, a lot of software research, and uh, the second thing I want to talk about is the impact of the virtual body. Um, there's been many studies of this. You can see on the top right something that we've been playing with. We had a lot of fun making pits um, and uh, dropping, forcing people to walk along planks, dropping things off them, and we've been doing it for years and years and years, and we love it. Um, it's the, it was our standard demonstration for ages. Um, so the avatar is essential for social interaction. It's also vital for presence for some people. And this is where I'm going to stick my neck out and say that a lot of what people have been saying about avatars not looking like themselves, being a hindrance, is actually less important to some people, uh, uh, some of the people in the uh, community than others. So we've got um, a study down at the bottom, which we, was actually run on a Gear VR, so you can download this experiment and contribute data if you want. Um, and we're talking about that at IEEE VR next week. Um, so this is quite a broad topic. Lots of people are interested in bodies. And recently, we've been trying to integrate some work from linguistics. Um, lots of people gesture when they talk. I do this. Lots of speakers talk. When they talk, they gesture. And that's the, you know, this hand, this representation, I mean, many, many games now have this sort of hand representation. But uh, we've... Just recently, again, sort of quite interesting result that, that um, we're showing next week is that actually not only important for a task, but it also helps with your memory. So if you're gesturing with your hands, it actually helps you to think about things. And this ties in with linguistic theories about people using their hands to sort of marshal their, their arguments in space. So this is an implication of this, is that um, having the avatar is good, no matter, um, even if it's not interactive for, for, that, for this task. So in this, that experiment, um, having an avatar significantly improved um, ability to perform a memory task, even though the hands weren't actually important for doing the task. Um, okay, so to summarize, um, two points. One is that latency is critical. Lower latency tends towards more natural interfaces, but these might not be the most efficient ones in all situations. Um, and the second summary point was that the virtual body is very important to some users, so I think that deserves some collective attention. Um, the virtual reality search may be found in a huge range of disciplines. So this, uh, this is from linguistics, um, one of the papers. Um, um, we published uh, the, some of the other work on latency in um, hardware journals. Um, and personally, I'd like to say that a very diverse review, research community makes for very exciting research collaborations, and I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to hopefully collaborating with some more games developers over the next couple of years. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm Evan Suma. I'm a research assistant professor at the UNC Institute for Creative Technologies, where I co-direct the MXR or Mixed Reality Lab. 
And I'd like to talk about one of the fundamental interaction challenges for virtual reality, which is human locomotion or movement in the VR environment. And what I'm specifically going to be focusing on is a specific type of locomotion, which is natural walking. So there's been an increasing interest as of late in room scale VR. Uh, but of course, in VR, we often want to go through virtual worlds that are much larger. And so if we have a room-sized physical space, this introduces a, a problem, which is what happens when I run out of physical space? I'm going to exit the tracking area or, at worst, collide into a wall and injure myself. Does this mean that as a, a VR community, we are fundamentally limited and forever doomed to wander through virtual worlds that are only the size of a single room? Well, fortunately, the answer to that is no. Uh, about 15 years ago, and there, there are many ways to tackle this problem, but uh, one very interesting way is called redirected walking. So researchers from Chapel Hill uh, introduced this idea of using human, mo manipulating the mapping between physical and virtual motions to decouple them and solve this problem. So in this example, we're actually going to apply a scale factor to the head rotation. So as you see this, I'll show that again. You might rotate, so for example, 90 degrees in the virtual world, but 180 degrees in the physical world. And the key here is it's a amplification or scale factor on the user's motion themselves. Another way you can do this is what's called curvature gain. So in this case, you don't actually rotate your body, but you move forward. And as you do so, it slowly and continuously rotates around you. And this can actually cause people to bend and walk along a curved path while perceiving they're walking straight. And then finally, there's also translation gains, which is uh, pretty simple. It's just amplifying the physical speed in the forward direction um, so that you can cover greater distances in the virtual world than the physical world. And if you take these sort of different techniques together, what you can really do is start to explore larger spaces in a virtual world while essentially reusing the physical space. So we put a couch here uh, kind of to give you the sense of scale. Um, and as you, uh, the user is walking back and forth in this virtual gallery, and you can see the uh, virtual path that they're taking in the world is overlaid in blue, but they're really um, in the phys their physical movements, they're going back and forth following the yellow path over and over. So these are pretty neat. Um, and so why does this work? So it turns out that this is a, just a property of how the human brain senses motion. So when there's two systems at play here, the visual system, what you're seeing, and the vestibular system, which is your uh, sense of balance and movement. So this is your inner ear, liquid swirling around in there. And when these two systems are in conflict, turns out that vision will dominate so long as the conflict is kept small enough. So the few researchers have studied this and come up with numbers. And it'd be really, these were done back in 2010. So actually, it'd be really interesting now with the consumer uh, VR technology to retest and see what these uh, numbers are, because they might vary from system to system. But the overall idea is, as long as we apply these manipulations the right way, they won't be noticeable. And that's really, when, uh, when I talk about noticeability, I'm talking about perceptual notab noticeability. This is a property of how the brain works, and it isn't conscious. It's subconscious. So I got really interested in redirected walking and started to think about other ways in which we could kind of solve this problem and apply perceptual illusions in new ways. Uh, and so this is one example. This is called a technique called change blindness redirection. So those of you who are in the uh, previous talk just before this one on your brain in VR saw the, the concept of change blindness introduced. And so what's going to happen here is as the user enters this back room here and is going to look in some crates, and something is going to happen behind their back. And you're going to be able to see it on the overhead view, but not the first person view in just a few moments. So as the user looks into these crates here, OK, something just happened there. So what just happened was we actually rotated the door so that it's 90 degrees off from uh, in the exit direction. And then we actually moved the door in the outer room to a different corner of the room. And so what ends up happening here is the user ends up exiting onto this gravel roadway in the physical world at the opposite corner. And so we can repeat this over and over and essentially extend that 30-foot long road into an infinitely long road over and over again. And so the really interesting thing here is because all these happen behind the user's back, it's really hard to detect this. I've run hundreds of people through this environment, both through informal demos and actually in you know, formal empirical experiments. And not a, it doesn't fool everyone, but the vast, vast majority of people don't notice. 
So this was a pretty powerful illusion. And so I started thinking more about other types of ways in which we could, you know, fool the senses. So this one, uh, the last one was inspired by psychology. This one's inspired by science fiction, the BBC television show Doctor Who. Those of you who are familiar with that will uh, have been introduced to the idea of a bigger on the inside illusion. And so here's an example of how we tested this in VR. So as a user walks, for example, down a hallway and then goes uh, to a door and, uh, and enters a room, we essentially swap rooms out in the area that's not visible. And so if we see what the, this environment actually looks like, it's a severe violation of Euclidean geometry. Both of these rooms could not exist in the same physical space, but since it's in VR, we can change it. And so, again, these illusions were very powerful. So when we actually uh, performed experiments on this, we found that you can compress and overlap these rooms by up to 50% before people will start to begin to notice that something's on, going on. And then here's another type of really interesting illusion that we uh, we can leverage for this same problem. Um, we call this flexible spaces, and it extends the uh, this previous idea and this by generating what's uh, just a series of twisty hallways. And you'll have to forgive the art here. This is researcher art, um, so we're not uh, always the best at 3D modeling. But the idea here is that the rooms themselves are pre-rendered and the hallways are procedurally generated on the fly. So every time, based on where you are in the space and where you choose to go, the engine just generates a hallway that kind of twists back in on itself. And um, this is a really interesting technique, and you kind of, again, you just kind of follow the turns of the hallway, and you can kind of tell, that, okay, I'm walking through a larger space than I could have been physically, but it doesn't make me sick because I'm not manipulating any kind of uh, perceptual illusions on motion, and it, um, it's pretty versatile. So we think this will be really interesting for games and educational experiences that don't really depend so much on the layout of the environment, but care about some sort of narrative or some presentation of educational content. Um, so it doesn't really matter the specific layout of the hallways. So in summary, uh, the laws of physics in VR really can be manipulated. They can be whatever we want them to be. And when you couple that with the observation that human perception is really adaptable and malleable, you can come up with some really interesting ways of improving usability. So, you know, leveraging human perception really to solve engineering problems. And in addition to that, also really uh, creating surreal, magical experiences like, you know, we'll ne you know, there's no other way that I can think of that to feel what it is to be in a room that's actually bigger on the inside than the outside. But we can do that in VR. And one other thing I just want to end with is uh, that we've kind of started wrapping up all of these techniques uh, that we've been studying in the research community into an open source toolkit um, so that you can kind of plug and play, drop these techniques into your environment. Um, so we just uh, released the first version of our toolkit. It works with the Rift, Vive, custom VR setups. Um, and it's open source, unrestricted license, so both commercial and non-commercial uses. Uh, permissible, so we'd encourage you guys to uh, download it and let us know what you think, and um, we'll see uh, what people can do with it. Okay. So I'm Pablo Figueroa, Associate Professor at the University of Los Andes in Colombia, and um, I'll try to wrap up this, this panel with uh, two main issues. The first one a part of the research that we have done with several people, including Mark Latoshik, one of our colleagues that is here. Um, and we try to answer several questions. One of them, how can we build better uh, mixed reality um, experiences? And one uh, that is also important, but is more difficult to, tack to tackle, is how we report findings in this field. So we have done several th uh, things in the nine, ten years uh, that we have been running uh, one special workshop in, in I2Pre VR. Uh, we have explored uh, different architectures, uh, talking about uh, data flows, uh, layer architectures, uh, virtual machines. Uh, we have explored uh, different programming languages that can be useful for VR and how these languages contribute to the final uh, understanding of what you are creating. For example, Scala, Haskell, Python. Um, we have seen video games in different VR setups. Uh, we have now uh, several setups for head-mounted displays, but in the future we can have also caves, tabletops, augmented reality uh, setups that will be uh, commercially and, and uh, 
um, cost effective enough uh, to have everywhere. Um, somebody also tried last year, I think, uh, an underwater solution with these uh, mobile uh, phones that you can put underwater. That was pretty cool, I think. And um, we also try several capabilities. We, we have talked about visual, we have uh, talked about audio, but what about touch, what about the smell, what about uh, other sensations? Uh, that is something that we uh, uh, have also tried in the past. So if, if you want to see some of these ideas um, in, in this uh, web page, and, and you can see a QR code for that, uh, you can find a list of all the papers that have been presented in IEEE VR in the last uh, several years, more than 15. And uh, some keywords that I've collected is, uh, all, all mistakes of the keywords are mine, of course. Um, it's, it's just an ad hoc uh, uh, selection of keywords that, that you may use for um, identifying these papers. And from those, uh, you can find the main topics that we have uh, worked in, the, in, the, in this uh, community. Of course, we, we are, uh, have talked about applications. Human factors is uh, just to talk about all the evaluations that we have done with people, new devices, distributed systems, new systems for VR, and so on. Uh, if we concentrate in just one of these type of topics, let's say applications, this is another uh, figure visualization that I, that I um, produced. Um, we have talked about uh, applications in software engineering, in simulation, uh, applications for haptics, and so on. So there are many things that we have covered, uh, and I'll, I'll be glad if, if any of you is interested in, in uh, going deeper into these uh, papers and talking with some of us or, or with other people in the community and try to, to develop this dialogue. So, as I said, uh, we would like to um, introduce this, this uh, group. It's a, it's a simple group in, in Google uh, Groups, uh, Myriad, Mixed Reality Research and Development. It's something that, is, that we are presenting right now here and will present next week in IEEE VR in a panel similar to this one, but with uh, researchers. Uh, so the idea is uh, for you to present trailers, overviews, uh, contributions of your experiences that you have uh, uh, developed and trying to post questions or issues that will be interesting to discuss with researchers or uh, developers. And that is the name of the, of the uh, group, myriad at uh, googlegroups.com. So thank you very much, uh, uh, first to my panelists and uh, to accepting the, the invitation here, and thank you for you to uh, for being here, and we are open for some questions. How's it going? Um, I'm super interested in uh, redirected walking. It's like one of the coolest things I've seen recently. Um, I just had a quick question on kind of the limitations of it. So if you have a you know, you want to trick somebody into walking in a circle and they're thinking they're walking straight. How big does, does the room need to be before they kind of can loop in on themselves without noticing? Um, it's a great question and I wish I had a single answer for you, but the answer really is it's complicated. Um, it depends on how uh, the path that they take. The more essentially turns that they have, um, the more movement that they make rather than just going in a straight line, the more opportunities you have to basically apply these types of illusions and uh, you know, steer them towards where you want them to go. Um, so you know, there, there's kind of some canonical numbers where if someone is just walking completely in a straight line, you need a huge space, something on the order of a 60 meter space uh, to, uh, by 60 meters to get them to uh, go in a circle without realizing it. Um, but again, if we can you know, design the environments in the right way to generate the movements and you know, provide properties to turn, you can do it in a much smaller space. Like the vibe tracking space is pretty reasonable? The vibe tracking space uh, does work for, for some environments. And so the, uh, the one that I showed um, do, was actually modeled for the vibe. Um, so you can do that. But you, you have to, if you're going to do it in a constrained space, I think you actually have to think about the techniques you want to apply and design the environment, during the design of the virtual environment itself. Hi. Um, thanks for sharing this research. It was really fascinating. Um, I have a somewhat general question. I was wondering, um, something that you guys all touched on uh, briefly, 
uh, is some of the differences between laboratory and consumer VR systems. Uh, I was wondering if you guys could comment on what you think some of the important differences are and uh, in what ways that affects how we translate some of this uh, research in VR into the consumer space, or if it doesn't at all. Sure. So, so um, yeah. So our lab equipment's consumer equipment at the moment. Um, for the majority, we we you know we have a Vive system, uh, uh, DK2s, and so on. Um, the key thing is that you really need to know exactly what you've got. Um, so, um, the, with the with the DK2, we we you know we take apart the tracking system, we rebuild it, um, so we know exactly you know what the latencies are and, and so on. So, um, the, the the key thing about a laboratory is you tend to have the same equipment for a while, um, so you maintain it, you know exactly what it does, you've metered it, you 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 know how it works inside out. Um, Having said that, as I mentioned in my talk, we, we, ran, we were trying to run experiments on just strictly on consumer equipment with actually outside the lab. So we've been trying that. There are often, often as a university, being ethical challenges doing that. Um, we can't run experiments with jump scares in them. That's just, you know, you would never get that path an ethics board. Um, it's fine as entertainment, but we can't induce people to take, it on, take on experiments. So there are issues there. Um, but then, you know, we are trying to... Uh, we've got a couple of collaborations with developers in London on using their games as experimental platforms. Um, so that, that, yeah. So, so, so to some, it's a very short answer is they're the same unless you have something very specific you want to do. Um, in our case, building very low latency equipment means getting out, you know, getting out the soldering iron. Yeah, I would add a couple of things to that. I mean, one is that... In a lot of cases, I think that the consumer VR equipment that's coming out now is equal to or better than a lot of the laboratory equipment we've used, in, at least in my lab, over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, we were very excited you know, four or five years ago when we got uh, an HMD that had 105 degree field of view. And that's pretty standard now, right? And this thing also weighed, I don't know, 10 kilograms or something. No, no not that much. A lot. Um, but the other thing is that uh, you have to be very careful in looking at the results that don't come from head-mounted display-based systems, right? So a lot of the work has been done uh, on projection, stereo, stereo projection walls or in caves or, or other setups, and um, there's big differences. You, you can't always generalize the results from, from a projection system to a head-mounted display-based system. Um, and then in terms of tracking, right? So uh, I think the tracking kind of also follows that rule that I mentioned uh, a minute ago, um, which is that the tracking we have today in many ways is a lot better than what we've used in labs in the last 10 or 15 years. So I think it's an opportunity to redo a lot of the kind of classic experiments and, and see how things have changed. You know, replication is a, is a foundation of the scientific method, so... And plus, it gets us more papers, right? <laughs> uh, just on the redirected question, uh, redirected walking issue, um, have you done experiments on how that might affect people for, with motion sickness, both without redirected walking and in each of the three different buckets with you know, curved, rotational, and translational? Uh, yeah, so there, there have been some studies of it. And so the, the short answer is um, that we know if you do it wrong, redirected walking uh, will make someone uh, sick. Um, the key is that you have to, you know, if you apply these manipulations in a subtle enough way, um, it, it, you know, it should be acceptable. However, the, the, the challenge there is that, um, as, as many people here probably are aware, that uh, people's sensitivity to motion sickness and simulator sickness varies widely. Uh, and the same thing generally we see, you know, with redirected walking in that some people you can do quite, get quite a lot and they will, you know, be very, fairly robust to it and some people are very, very sensitive. Um, so I think there isn't really a catch-all number and the, um, the, the right way to do it is really to perhaps measure someone's sensitivity or at least have some sort of baseline so you know um, how, much, how much can you apply for that particular individual. Cool, thanks. Um, I actually had a question about uh, something that you were talking about, uh, uh, Professor Bowman. 
You were saying earlier uh, to make uh, interactions less like the real world, but uh, what about uh, giving users preconceived notions that they come with when they're entering into VR? Shouldn't we support the interactions that they already have with, uh, you know, grabbing a cup or uh, something like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think that the, you know, going the natural route is often the right way to go. Um, it depends on what your application is, what your task is, and, and so on. But if it's a walk up and use experience, people have to be able to figure it out in 10 seconds, um, and the tasks are not really all that difficult, then natural techniques can be very effective for that. Um, the, you know, one thing you can do is kind of tr try to bridge between the natural techniques and the magical techniques. So I use this term hypernaturalism. Um, so a good example there is this technique called the go-go technique, old, old 3D manipulation technique uh, done by Ivan Puparev, um, which used this inspector gadget arm, uh, you know, go-go gadget arm uh, sort of metaphor. And so the nice thing about that is that it's, it's hypernatural. Um, you reach out using exactly the same motion that you would use to reach out in the real world. It's just that your arm extends a lot further into the virtual world. And so people know how to use that intuitively, even though it's magical. But I've also seen reports and some research saying that having that uh, stretching-like ability or even superhero or superhuman abilities will actually make them very disoriented after the VR experience. Isn't that something we, wouldn't, we would want to avoid? I mean, there are definitely cases where you can have after effects of, um, you know, if you, if you do too much adaptation of what the brain is perceiving or how the body is acting in VR, then you could have after effects in the real world. I don't know that that's the case with, um, with the go go technique or others like it. I haven't studied that personally. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a question that should be addressed. Um, I think most of that after effects research has been, been done on the perceptual side. So for example, if your HMD has distortions um, uh, due to the optics, those distortions can cause you to, to uh, have, have issues with motor tasks in the real world after you remove the HMD. So I think more work needs to be done there, but that's, a, that's an important consideration. Thank you. I would add uh, just quickly one other thing to that answer, and that's the, um, that in the cases where there is an adaptation and an after effect, the um, the effects, uh, the brain is pretty adaptable, and the uh, human visual and perceptual systems um, will readjust, and uh, it's called perceptual recalibration. Um, and we're talking about minutes, you know, five to ten minutes. And it's, they've done some even really interesting studies by, you know, even before VR in the days where they would drive people around fields on tractors towing treadmills, and people would walk on different speeds while getting different visual information. And then, you know, they get off the tractor, and then they're, like, falling down because they they're, don't know how to walk anymore. But, again, we're talking about the matter of minutes uh, to, to recalibrate uh, afterwards. Um, so there, even in the cases where there is some sort of lingering after effect, it's probably not going to be very long. Uh, current consumers are dealing with HMD systems, but I'm curious about like mini cave type of systems. Uh, what are the, like, the pros and cons of a mini cave system like uh, usability and immersion? Sure. Yeah. Um, um, the key, well, well uh, it's one of my favorite topics. Uh, one, of, one of the key things about a cave system is the, the impact of latency isn't so high. Um, and that's why you, know, you saw dips in the use of head-mounted displays throughout the two, 2000s, essentially. Um, and labs like uh, many of ours had, have cave systems. So um, the, that technology is changing very quickly. Um, so you know, it's probably a price cartel that means that your projectors don't cost $5 now because there's no moving parts in them. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the key thing is that, they, they, that you can't get anything between here and here. So, you, you know, you, you can draw a body, but you can't, you can't change the body um, because you're going to see it, and then you can't get anything here. So um, a lot of the techniques that people have come up with for grasping objects and so on just simply won't work. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of change, a lot of adaption to, to that situation, but I'm personally convinced that, you know, that that'll be one option in, in uh, three to five years. Uh, there are plenty of people working on large surround projectors. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would just add to that that we've seen a shift in the research community, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so, where HMDs kind of fell out of favor and people really uh, started to use these projection based uh, surround systems like caves because of many of the advantages that Anthony mentioned.
And it, it'd be interesting to see if that same sort of shift takes place in the consumer VR space. Yeah. I, w I will have to point out just one thing is that they've been declared to be the new thing again in VR, uh, caves, displays. Uh, I saw an article a couple of weeks ago. Um, but it, yeah, we had our first one in 99, and Carolina, who generated, uh, built the first one, that was 1992, believe it or not. So my question is about standards, or if you're not comfortable with, with the word, we'll call them best practices. Mm -hmm. Are there any things in your research or in VR in general that you think are stable or known enough at this point that we could codify them or at least mention them as best practices? No one wants to take that question. <laughs> but you can see our silence. <laughs> uh, in general, there, there are no standards. We have tried uh, yeah. for a while to, to see if we can come up with uh, ways to standardize this, but first, technology changes too much. Uh, that makes some of our assumptions that we uh, deal in the past uh, totally unusable in the future. And second, um, we are trying new applications, new things, and new solutions that also make our assumptions, previous assumptions, uh, invalid. So. That's why we are still doing research. Yeah, if I, uh, if I could add on to that, there's, the hesit there's a hesitation uh, because I think if you had asked this question, say, you know, six years ago, five years ago, um, one of the kind of things that I was always told as a student was uh, minimum frame rate, uh, you know, you need 60 hertz. 60 hertz is the magic number. And we, we didn't have really head-mounted displays that could, you know, do 75, 90 hertz, and now having been able to be to see what 90 hertz feels like, 60 is not anywhere close to, to sufficient. Um, and so I think that you know, as the technology is improving, where where you know our standards and previous best practices are, are you know becoming more suspect. Evan, when when I was a student, it was 30 hertz. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Last just, question. I would just, uh, just, uh, can I just add one more point, which is that um, standards are sort of hard for academics to work on, to be completely frank, um, because, as mentioned, things change. Also because uh, you, know, you constantly develop things which work in specific situations, so especially with the 3D user interfaces. Um, so, yeah, all this work on latency, it was just you know, a lot of results are done and are completely invalid because you don't have... You know, until about two years ago, you didn't have systems that are under 30 milliseconds latency. And yeah, the mo uh, this result on the motor system latency being fat now, now hitting that is actually something that wasn't predicted. Um, so it's a classic case of a model that existed on latency, which is actually now we know isn't, isn't true. Um, yeah. So um, I wanted to ask if you guys had any ideas or if there are efforts going on about bridging that gap between the academic world and the sort of industry world. And certainly this sort of venue seems like a step in that direction, the open sourcing of uh, techniques. Uh, but for example, having been a PhD student in the past, I know that like presenting here wouldn't count toward your publications, right? So. Do you guys see that there is there is going to be like a change in the academic community to be closer to be maybe faster uh, with these technology changes uh, to the industry trends? Well, I, I think uh, some some professors can afford to come here and then to VR, uh, but not all of us. So um, that that. That might happen, but hopefully this type of, of uh, communities between uh, researchers and, and developers will, will grow in the future, but that is something that we are still building. I have to cut because uh, we, we have another presentation in a few minutes. Don't forget the evaluation, and thank you for being here. <laughs>